thank you all for uh, coming to the seminar. Uh, this uh, seminar was, uh, um, um, is going to be on the same thing I uh, spoke about at the ARIS conference, uh, how many weeks ago, now? three weeks ago. And um, it's going to um, be describing the, uh, the model that we have been working on. But we have more time, so I will be a bit chatty, okay? Because at the ARIS conference, there was only 15 minutes. I might have used a bit more, but uh, so I can be relaxed. You can stop me if you wish. I'm happy for you to do that. Um, and uh, we can uh, um, have more discussion here. Uh, so whole farm models uh, are very useful tools. Um, and why are they useful? Well, because they allow us to look at a farm and do a few things. In terms of farm management, we can use whole farm mo models to study farm management. We can use whole farm models to uh, do uh, policy analysis. For example, if we are looking at what farmers would do if we change uh, prices or for inputs, outputs, or if we change something else that affects choice um, in terms of uh, um, um, uh, restrictions on land use, for example, and so on. Uh, so they are useful for agricultural policy and environmental policy. They are also useful for pricing resources. For example, the whole farm model uh, would give you shadow prices for land, for example. What's land worth to a farmer? So if I want to know what the value of uh, land to a farmer is, I can work out the the, the value curve by using a whole farm model. Okay? Uh, what a farmer is willing to pay for more land depends upon what they can make out of it. And uh, this is a good way to uh, evaluate that. Uh, they can be flexible, can be built at different levels of complexity. What do we mean here? Uh, because in a moment I'm going to say they are complex. Okay? Even within that complexity, you can make them simpler. Um, um, and so on. Why? Because I could have a whole farm model that aggregates things, so it's like a coarse model looking at a few enterprises. Okay? I could, for example, ignore livestock or represent livestock using something simpler, but then focus on the land use and, and so on. Someone could build a whole farm model they don't go into the details of wheat, barley, oats, and so on. They just group them as cereal, and then they have canola, they have some other things. Okay? I could group pastures into one. It depends on what type of detail you are looking for, but they can, uh, they can be um, uh, specified at different levels. Uh, most people uh, who are ag economists will know what they are, but these days you can never be sure because ag economics teaching is changing. You know, you walk into a, a, a place to teach and then say, you know about this, of course, and the students will say, what are you talking about? We are not from the 80s. <laughs> we, are, we, are, we are from uh, the 2000s. Yeah, everything changes. Uh, so modeling farms, what do we study about farms? Well, a lot of ag econ research is driven by what he can do. You know, somebody comes up with a method and people will use the method and there will be a lot of research. So just create a trick, okay? Give, give people something to do and <laughs> they will be busy for a long time until something better comes. Uh, so a lot of research in, in, uh, on agriculture is driven by what the next method. Um, and it can be a bit unbalanced because there can be things that could be studied, but they are not cool. Because the tools that you could use to study them don't get you publication. So they might be more important, but for research, you, the research is here. The real story is out here, okay? So you can have uh, those problems. And what happens is in a lot of cases, people study single enterprise. So I might study maize production or cassava production or something. Um, and leave the rest of the stuff outside, uh, or just aggregate. So take the whole farm, but just lump the whole farm into one thing. There is output, okay, whether it's livestock or crops, just one, and then go on and do your analysis. But the detail is hidden. Uh, but 
I think one of the exciting things uh, from the 70s or 80s was something called farming systems. So uh, when we went to university, of course, uh, from a science background or something, you don't, your, your thinking is here and then you go to university and this economists say, actually, we have to start thinking uh, along um, uh, the, uh, the farming systems type approach. And then all of a sudden, a farm is not simple. A farm is just a very active, very complex, very interesting thing where um, everything affects everything. I studied Ag Econ in Ethiopia at a university called Alamaya, which is a, uh, one of the oldest two universities um, and is the first agricultural university. Um, and um, there were German uh, uh, ag economists from Eastern Germany because Ethiopia used to be a socialist country in the 80s. So our socialist brothers would come over and they would teach in the universities. And these uh, researchers had come with this idea of farming systems. They were very keen. It was, a, I think it was understood to be a French system way of thinking, but uh, these, uh, people were very keen and they would go to these farms uh, where the farmers were growing something called chat. Anyone knows what chat is? A narcotic? Because it's a cash crop, that's what the farmers in Eastern Ethiopia used to grow, we would go to Djibouti and on a plane would get in Saudi Arabia. I was like, you could see a farmer carrying 10,000 in a bag when every farmer in the country elsewhere would be lucky enough to see a thousand, okay? Uh, so this, these researchers came and they went into these villages and they were looking at, uh, you know, stubble and stuff. And they had these little computers at Alamea. You know Alamea, right? Uh, at Alamea and they were entering these things uh, the details, but they were quite serious about this stuff. Uh, what wasn't there is when you study Agicon, okay, you can learn it, but then you can't use it because it's just a way of thinking. There is no way for you to analyze things with that because you don't have the model, you don't have the data. So most research everywhere is, uh, is like that, but they did leave one paper on whole farm modeling in Ethiopia. I think Jeff found it last uh, year. Uh, they did make a whole farm model from, uh, was it late 80s or early 90s? They did leave a whole farm model, which was interesting. They made. So the farming systems approach encourages you to use a whole farm model, okay? Because what you are after is after the synergy uh, between the different things. Um, so what you do with cropping is relevant for livestock because livestock depend on cropping, stubble and so on, that's one. But also the land use for determines how much crop you can have and how much pasture you can have and so on. Uh, so they are useful, uh, but they can be difficult to build. And my, one of the points I, I, I make in this presentation is uh, I think we should be seeing more applications of whole farm models because they are rich, they are more useful, but we don't see because they are, you, you, they are like an infrastructure model, okay? You need to build a whole farm model, you need to spend a lot more time than you have when you do a master's or a PhD, okay? Even as a PhD student, I have seen some PhD students doing whole farm modeling. Even within the three years, they cannot fit construct a whole farm model for a new place. It's not possible. You can adapt one with good help, like Midas, but you cannot build one uh, and do a good job unless you have been an agricultural researcher and you know the place very well, you know the data and so on. So they can be difficult to build unless they are a toy model. Uh, most agricultural systems are, have several crops. Um, you have to worry about crop rotation and sequencing. That's the whole idea of crop rotation is what you plant um, last year and the year before affects what you should expect this year from your yield. So you cannot use simple yield curves to just uh, decide what you should grow. Uh, <clears throat> each crop cannot be modeled as a fixed yield crop, which is what most people would find it easy to do. But then uh, if you are, want to optimize, you also need to optimize the level of fertilization and so on, so the yield is not a, a number, okay? 
and uh, you have livestock. Livestock is very interesting because it's the hardest in, in modeling um, um, whole farm models. Because why is that hard? Because livestock is, um, is, is, is life, okay? So it's life, you know, you have to think about the reproduction, you have to think about the energy demand, uh, and you have to think about the different outputs and so on. Um, so you have to think about mortality rates, all those things, shearing and so on. Huh? Here, here, there are some uh, modelers from Midas days, right? <laughs> Mike and uh, Steve here. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, you, so you have been doing this a lot in, uh, was this in the 80s you guys were? Yeah. 90s, right? 90s, 90s. <laughs> 80s and 90s, yeah. Um, and, and you have to think of the synergies between the two. And of course, there is environmental issues. One way, uh, one good reason to use whole farm models is if you want to model emissions like carbon emissions and nitrate leaching and so on, then um, you have to link these things to what you do with the land. Um, if you cannot build your own, you can adapt, but I think people have, who have looked at something like Midas would know, you might spend lots and lots of time going through spreadsheets and so on to know what to do, okay? Um, and how many have we had adapting Midas in the last two uh, decades? You could count them on one hand, okay? We don't... Uh, Tosh was one. There might have been a couple others. Uh, Redmond. Redmond, yeah. So I looked at my dust uh, and then I put it aside and went and wrote my own gum code because it, took, it takes more time to do that. Well, if we had active research going on, probably you would. But the way my dust is set up, that uh, wasn't uh, an option for me. Um, of course, once you set it up, you have to solve it. It's a linear programming or some kind of mathematical programming problem. So after you have done all your work, you have to have a good way of solving it as well. Um, and then you have to analyze the results. Sometimes you spend all the effort and then you get the results and then that's when the work begins. What do you do with the results? Yeah. Um, just to give you an example, this is uh, from a wheat yield curve from a long time ago. Um, for cutting, for example, if you think of yield, we, if you take the actual data, fit a yield curve, it's a quadratic function of uh, rainfall and um, nitrogen, just taking two, two of the most important inputs. Um, but as you can see, you shouldn't just take a yield level that's fixed. Okay? What, what level of fertilization you use and so on has to to be part of the story. The rainfall has to be also part of the story because you have to adapt the, um, the, the yield to the rainfall level. And um, as I said earlier, because this was a short presentation, I didn't include much about um, um, where this came from, but this whole thing began uh, from our interest in the Katanin region. And, um, and the Katanin region is a region where several crops are grown. Uh, livestock is mostly sheep, uh, but farmers would need to make choice about crops. You would need production parameters for your crops. Okay, you wouldn't just plug in numbers. As I said, uh, available land resources would have to be taken into account. So, in whole farm modeling, you can ignore paddocks and say the farmer has 2,000 hectares. And say, well, among, uh, out of this 2,000, uh, 500 is this type of soil, 500 is another type of soil, 700 is this, and just to do that, okay? But farmers don't do agriculture that way. They don't have 2,000 hectares. They have 2,000 hectares, but they have paddocks, okay? Land management is by paddock. Uh, so for the Katanin region, Farmers would have roughly, I think this is data from 10 plus years ago, 20 paddocks, okay? So they are allocating paddocks, not areas. And 
What does that mean? Your whole farm model is not a linear programming model anymore, like most models are. You are allocating discrete uh, units of uh, land resource into land uses, so it is becomes a mixed integer programming problem, which is a lot harder to solve. But the advantage is, if you solve the model for a farm, then you are actually coming up with, with land uses that correspond to what the farmer does. Okay. Uh, so they have uh, paddocks, um, optimize uh, livestock enterprise. What does it mean to optimize livestock enterprise? Well, when I began doing this work, I didn't have to think about livestock much. Okay. Uh, but once you start modeling, then all the problems come. Okay. What does it mean to optimize livestock? Well, it's you are choosing type of livestock, even among uh, sheep, you crossbreed, merino. Uh, you are choosing for how long to keep them. You are choosing what, whether you purchase, and if you are purchasing, at what age? And if you are selling them, at what age? What do you feed them? Pasture, stubble, grains, what type of grains? Over what months? Uh, what energy levels do they get from the different sources? Uh, what energy levels do they need when they are uh, pregnant, when they are lactating? All this, Jeff uh, has done a lot of good work. Jeff is a co-author here. Um, uh, comes uh, uh, from, uh, well, from EWA Maths in Sussex, but was at the International Livestock Center for Africa. Uh, which is now part of what's called ILRI, uh, International Livestock Research Institute. Uh, so he was familiar with this livestock research and uh, he knows a lot more about that, but uh, it was good to have him because he was able to pull out a lot of this information. So this we did more than 10 years ago, um, and then when the project ended, it was sitting aside and then we are dusting it off and uh, looking at it again. But livestock um, uh, is, 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 has got a lot of things to do that you need to sort out. Uh, and also you have to distinguish between the sex and age. So if you are modeling one type of sheep, there are two sexes and there are, you have to keep track of the age. So all of a sudden what you have is you have a lot of parameters to variables to keep track of. So in the example we have been using, in the modeling we have been using, for example, if you think you keep the ship for seven years, the model will allow it to shorten it, no problem. And that's one of the things I have been working hard on is to make it flexible. But then you have 84 months, okay? 84 months and two types. So you have, par your, your, your ship population is described by 84 times two, 168 variables and the model has to optimize those as well, among many other things. Um, you have to balance energy, of course, we know that. Um, can it be made easier? Um, the answer is yes. And that's what we have been working on. The answer is yes. Where did we start? Actually, we started with something different. We wanted to build a catchment level model for the Katanning region, the whole region. 306,000 hectares, close to 200 farms. We had never done a, a modeling like that, except that we were ag economists, and I also had uh, uh, some interest in uh, building models, uh, like uh, programming. Um, and there was a project for dry and salinity when dry land salinity was a big story in Australia. Um, that's where it began. So what were we going to do with the model? The model was to represent every farm in the landscape, build a model for whole farm modeling for each of them. So the model would solve all this optimization for all the farms. And the choices that the farmers would do was between cropping and planting uh, perennial pastures like um, saltbush and lucerne and so on to tackle 
uh, the dry land salinity problem. The reason is we were trying to figure out if you could give farmers incentives to switch from crops to uh, perennial pastures like Lucerne, whether you would have an impact on the hydrology. So to do that, you need a hydrology model, um, and uh, this was something like SWAT, um, but SWAT didn't have Lucerne, SWAT didn't have Saltbush, SWAT didn't have Oil Mali, which were the three uh, uh, cover types, and we did a lot of hard work to put them into the plant database for uh, SWAT and so on. That's where this began. There was a report from it, uh, but the amount of money you had to pay farmers according to what SWAT was telling us was, uh, was ridiculous. <laughs> and, and the thing didn't get published, so, um, but the report is out there, and now we are revising the data, but we are not going to do the hydrology modeling again. We'll just do we'll just look at what farmers would do, okay, without uh, falling hostage to the hydrology again. Um, some work on the software was done when Kai Tang was doing his PhD here. Kai Tang is now back in China, uh, but um, he was the first one to apply this. There is a paper in, uh, where was the paper? Uh, was it Ager? I think Ager. Um, uh, on, he applied, use the model, uh, after we had added, uh, well, with his help, I had added uh, greenhouse gas emissions to estimate greenhouse gas emission costs for farmers. And he got something that was between 20 and 30. Using a different method, distance functions, he had done the same thing he had gotten within that range. And the estimates uh, you will see later um, uh, uh, were different from what most people uh, got. So that was the first publication from the model. Uh, it had been simplified. He had to only just do stuff to get it to run. He didn't have to waste a lot of time. So this paper was one of his three papers. Otherwise, it would have been, whole farm modeling would have been his entire research because he would have had needed more time. So it's possible to make it simpler. Um, and simpler in many ways. Uh, you need to make it first easy for people to include land use livestock enterprise so that they just choose things, okay? Um, and you have to come with a flexible idea of land use as well. The model is set up for land uses. Land use have structures. But then what happens if I want um, to go to different weed types, or manage the same crop differently, but I want to optimize that, okay? You can have the same crop as two different land use and the model would work fine, okay? So that's a way of building in flexibility. Um, same with livestock. You have to have flexibility. This is not done yet, but eventually uh, it should allow you, for example, for cutting, you say May is the lambing month, okay? But some people are interested in alternative lambing months. So you should be able to allow people to do alternative lambing months easily. So I would give in my model as a choice um, an inter a livestock enterprise where the lambing is May, but I could have another where the lambing is, what was it, September? Is that uh, some of the students were studying for their master's research? So that's something that should be done and can be done. Uh, but how do you make it easier for people to put in so much data? There is so much data that needs to go into a model. Uh, what we have devised is nothing new, a table. <laughs> okay? Uh, so if you use a table, that's the easiest way because then it's very easy for people to see and know what they should do and what they have and don't have. Well, so it's, this is not, this is five, five fine font, but that's with, for example, let's take one. So the way we have it set up is we have a production function. That was, this is estimates for cutting, by the way. And it tells you um, what the coefficient for nitrogen, nitrogen square, rainfall, rainfall square. This is a quadratic function. Um, and 
because this was data from the early 2000s, there was droughts, so we had dummies to account for the droughts and so on. There were dummies for um, soil type somewhere um, and so on. No, soil type was on the efficiency, not on the main function. But then you go, um, you can specify what stubble you get by months going down. So this gives you stubble. Uh, you can do the same thing with the stable energy and so on, greenhouse gas emissions. So greenhouse gas emissions from um, uh, wheat, for example, uh, from uh, nitrogen fixation or something, whatever it is. I cannot read this, but there is a lot of stuff. Where does this stuff come from? Well, I think there was a greenhouse gas inventory or something. There was a national database that was set up, and one of our master's students had done work, which we co-supervised with Russ. There is a paper in Ag Systems. That's how we got hold of the data first, and then brought it into the um, whole farm model. So, in short, you make it easy for people to specify what a land is. is the production function, uh, what type of emissions, and so on, they would have from it, and so on, and the model would take this to work on, 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 on the, um. so in the one that, uh, in the software that Kai was using, for example, there is land use parameters, but there is also another one for livestock, okay? So there are two Excel tables. So being able to run the model means you take a region, you look at these tables and say, okay, what do I need to do here in these two spreadsheets to be able to run the model for this region? So in terms of livestock, um, you have the same thing. So there is stuff for pregnancy proportions and all sorts of stuff. So there is X, B, and M, A, R. Um, so that's one way to make it easier, is to let people, and then you have to make it easier for people to set up their land. So in this case, for example, there is 12 paddocks. Um, Kai Tang had chosen 12 paddocks because he, he had taken sort of an average farm for uh, somewhere, uh, but um, I'm not sure why it's 12, because my, the bigger data set, uh, he had not covered the whole region. He had, I think, 23 farms somewhere from Katanning, not the whole region. But the, for the bigger region, I think there is more paddocks. So there is area, there is uh, rainfall, um, there is soil ID, soil quality, uh, actually, in the model right now, you use only one of them, but I, I put it in there so that in case you want some, some other time you want to distinguish between type and quality and how that affects um, crop output. And then there is the history. From talking to um, Russell many years ago, he said, okay, how far should we go back? How shall, in terms of worrying about the history of land is, he said, ideally three years, but two years is good. Okay, so we, we went with two. Because if you go with three, this is a permutation. The mathematical problem becomes much bigger, okay? So if you have uh, six land uses, and if you want history for the last three years, that's six to the power of three, uh, which is much bigger than six to the power of two. So that's why um, we chose two, a compromise. Um, So, just to, is this going to work? I'll give you a break from me speaking. <laughs> so, there's two minutes. Um, Just to give you a sense of how is it to set up things. Um, why is it? I see it's spinning here, but not so. Okay. With HelloFresh meal kits, I'm at. Another art.
Ja. So that's choosing the land use parameter stuff. Um, I should just stop it here. Um, so what happened is that's what Kai was using here. But this was done five years ago. And uh, I was just beginning to work on the interface, just getting by. So I didn't have the luxury of making it good. Uh, but still, there was a place where you could click and paste a, um, a CSV file into it. And now he is using it to supervise um, in in China, and he has done a couple of papers. So I guess that's what he's doing. He's preparing his uh, spreadsheet and pasting it into it. Um, then he choose your land use, uh, what to include, and so on. So if you are just testing, you could include only some. You could change things here, um, and then you choose land use. Ah, uh, yes, you choose, uh, thank you, you choose land use. So what's happening here is you can specify minimum and maximum number of use for a land use. Why is that important? Well, if you are being contracted to, to plant lucerne, you cannot just grow lucerne now and take it out next year. Okay, so you need to have a minimum. And this is the uh, livestock, so you can decide how long they live for and many other things. And then this is a stubble. You select what to feed them, which ones, and so on. Um, and this is a grain feed. Um, you can select. And you choose the time horizon. Um, then you can adjust the prices for the crops. Um, you can adjust the greenhouse gas prices if you are modeling that. Um, then you say optimize. It sets up. Okay. Now, where is this happening? This is one of the innovations in this one. Is it was set up so that you could have it on a an iPad and so on. Of course, an iPad cannot solve a mixed integer programming problem. Okay. And even if you have a laptop, uh, you need GAMS. And you need something like Cplex, which is a commercial software or something equivalent. And that's going to cost you, by the time you get Cplex, you probably close to 2,000 years. So what I have, what is that? <laughs> uh, YouTube. Um, OK. So what I have done is I have written it so that it takes a mixed integer programming problem, it writes it, sends it over to the new server, solves it, and it gets the results back. And usually it takes only a few seconds, OK? Uh, and then it processes the results. That's what's happening. So that's one of the. Uh, the, the good things w with this one is then you don't have to have the solver to solve it. Of course, the new solvers that are the US, that's a public service, uh, you have to be careful with commercial use because they are meant to be for research. Uh, but what the software does is it writes out the equations, it writes out the matrices, so I can very easily um, write out the problem so that it can be solved locally, one, if you have GAMS. Second, I can do that with R. So that's the two additions I am going to do, um, and that's very easy to do, is to, if you are using it, and if you are not sure that you are allowed to use this for commercial purposes, then you can solve it on your, on your machine uh, using R, which is uh, free. So um, that's a paper by Kai. And what he had done is uh, gas, um, greenhouse gas emission uh, stuff. And um, this is the uh, uh, emission stuff he was modeling. 
Um, this is his estimate for what it would cost farmers. And of course, um, he got this. Uh, did I say more than 420? It was close to 20. But many of the other estimates that were out there were huge. Okay? Uh, of course, not believable. Okay? Uh, it doesn't take farmers uh, 50 and 130. Uh, and of course, it's easier for livestock farmers to cut back on, on, on uh, carbon. So, as I said earlier, um, one of the things that people would be keen to do with whole farmers is not just farm management, it will be environmental stuff. And um, if you have a model that makes it easier for people to specify what type of environmental um, effects, uh, whether positive or negative, they can do, it uh, will be useful. So, what are we doing right now? I am still working on improving stuff. Uh, because it's already set, um, uh, we are keen on making this usable, usable so that people can use it without a pain, without pain. Okay, no, no. Uh, as, and that's that's my mission right now is to make it simpler for people to use. Um, how? Well, improving it. Uh, so, improving, uh, including allowing people to graph things and so on. Uh, developing shared database will be useful. Why is that? As I said, there is a spreadsheet that people can use, but then if you develop uh, spreadsheets for different regions, then it becomes easier for people to adapt things. Uh, Jeff is keen to develop a version for Ethiopia. Now, taking the model and applying it into anywhere in Australia is easy because it's similar structure. The land uses might change, but it's, farmers have paddocks, farmers have similar resources. But taking it overseas and using it, the first thing that comes is this is a model that's key, that's focused on optimizing paddock use, okay? Uh, among other things. Now what does, how many paddocks do, how many plots do farmers have? And then you worry because they don't have, maybe they don't have many, okay? But if you are doing it at a bigger level, a village level, or, uh, and you have to have a reason for that, which is possible to come up with, then it becomes useful. Okay? Uh, so that's one thing. Um, I am also looking for a wish list, because five years ago when I set this up uh, for Kai to use, I was sort of just getting by and doing things, just getting it to a level, but now, uh, I have begun sitting back and unpacking it and staring at it again and adding things to make it more flexible, okay? And that's what I do. I like to do that. Uh, that's my hobby. It doesn't cause me any pain. Uh, if I get bored with anything, it's this type of stuff that I like to do, is to just stare at these huge matrices and think about how I am going to arrange things so that it works. So this morning, what I was doing is I was writing things to change it so that you could have pasture or stubble. The stubble is available for so many months for one type of livestock, but for a different set of months for another set of livestock, which can be useful because you can have, I don't know what people will use it for. So what I'm trying to do is make it flexible, as flexible as I can so that it can um, be used by many people uh, so that's one, allow people to, to, to um, uh, manage livestock differently. Uh, also, what, one thing we want to do, and we have been talking about this with Jeff, is livestock is complex. Can we allow people to model livestock using simpler means? What's a simpler mean as a livestock unit? Okay. So basically, without specifying the, um, all the details of uh, you know, the mortality and so on, can you do a livestock unit, which is like a sort of an aggregation equivalent to crops? Uh, so that's something that we would like to have. Because if we have that, people who don't have a lot of time or resources to go into the details of modeling uh, livestock, like cattle and so on, in fact, this began because we were worried by the fact that some farmers have cattle, and we didn't have cattle in the model. Um, so t we had done sh sheep, but cattle would be also a lot of work. So can you do livestock units? I would like feedback, actually, from 
the audience on this uh, fine tuning that should be um, towards uh, energy sources. On the first go, I didn't have hay in there, but what happens if farmers cut and store hay, which they do? So I have begun including that. Okay. Um, other thing is, how do you? Farmers are not going to come with a production. Researchers won't come with a production function. Somebody might want to use a whole farm model, but they never had a production function for the region. What do you do? Well, of course, you have to allow them <coughs> to use simpler forms, or you have to give them a tool to construct their own production function. Okay? And this can be done as part of the uh, software. Uh, it just takes time. <laughs> but it's possible to allow people to pre-process uh, production data, cost data as well. Okay, so right now for crops we have cost data. Nitrogen is separate, but there is a variable cost for everything else, and we need that. Uh, one thing I haven't sorted out, and we haven't discussed, is we have labor for livestock, shearing and so on, but we don't have labor for crops, which we should include. So that is something, uh, because you can easily say, well, labor we just take it as so much per hectare, okay? Let's just put it in variable cost. But there could be circumstances where farmers are constrained by labor for certain types of enterprise, not everything. Uh, and it would be good to have that option. Where is all this free stuff coming from? Well, if you are solving this on news, <coughs> which is a commercial grade sol solvers, I don't have to worry about how complex the problem is, as long as I can make it. Because solvers like CPLEX, so far, I haven't had a problem where it cannot be solved. So, thanks to NEOS, I can, I can uh, put my wish list. Huh? Um, intercropping. How do you model intercropping? So, I was doing some changes for people to be able to have multiple crops. That's something I added this week, because if you have multiple cro uh, cropping, then the pasture from the same crop could be coming from two different times in the year. And that wasn't part of the original, so I am putting that in. But intercropping, so far we have been saying, well, if it's intercropping, just create a new type of land use and specify things. But that's a way to go, but we are, that requires some thinking. In developing countries, intercropping would be important. So if you are just after the output in terms of value and so on, and the cost, that's easy. But if you are interested in what type of uh, stable you are getting that detail, then that's a different story because you cannot just ignore the fact that you have two types of plant uh, externalities. We have GHG. What else? Nitrate leaching, you can model it as an add-on because we have nitrogen, but is there something else that should be modeled? Uh, so, I haven't done any real work, but I am starting to think maybe I should have in the model something that allows people to add in an externality without knowing what the externality is for me. But they can specify the link between the inter externality and land use or crop types. And that's something I can do. Um, processing results. Sometimes the heavy part is you get your data, your results, then you have to analyze. And analysis is not always easy. So it, right now it organizes things by paddock. For example, it shows you what you grow on a paddock, what is, and so on. But more will be useful. It writes out the equations, so you can use LaTeX to actually read the equations. This is good for checking. Not for the user, but for me while I'm writing it mainly, but for the user it would be for writing out reports. Um, could this ever be relevant to farmers? <laughs> because farm, how do farmers, now it takes you back to the question, why would a farmer want something like this? Um, I think that's a whole different level. You can get keen farmers like Mike, uh, what, John Young, uh, type, the person who does the Midas stuff, but for, for this to be useful for farmers, you have to add another layer, which is link this to their uh, cash flow um, to, and, and so on, to the, how they manage their inputs and outputs. But 
That's not impossible, but that's not that that's that's not planned for the next two years or so because we want to have a good model for researchers first, uh, but it doesn't mean that we want to go to Catanning and uh, we are planning to do a survey with uh, Jeff actually. We want to go to Catanning and sit down with some. I think Jeff might do that and show it to the farmers. But to make it useful for farmers, you need to bring it closer to the management. I have used up all the time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, That's important. There are two things that I haven't mentioned. One is accommodating risk. The other one is what if you have uh, something other than just profit maximization or gross margin maximization, like household type problems. It doesn't. Um, um, that could be done. But so far, it's right now it's two people um, it's a two-man show, <laughs> so resources, you know, but uh, once we get done with this, it would, it could, I mean, it would be good to have that, um, but we need more resources. Okay, I've got a, a more philosophical question. Yeah. Um, I think the objective of simplification is really admirable yeah. because it becomes more, more used and more... But how do you know simplification is is working if you don't have the complex to ch check against? Well, the simplification is to make it easier for the researcher to set up the model, not the complexity of what's modeled. Because what's modeled is still not, not simple. It's complex. So, for example, when I was showing the table for the land use, the table was had all the complexities you could. For example, your yield for um, wheat is dependent on rainfall, is dependent on nitrogen, is dependent on other things. So the simplicity is not in how the farm is represented. If it had been, then my job would be much easier. But, but you are, in effect, specifying a, a, much, a subset of the production possibilities with your livestock, you're wanting to focus on a, on a few um, uh, livestock strategies rather than yeah. all of them. Yeah. So how do you how do you focus down to what are the acceptable ones? I don't. Do? Actually, in the model, you can choose any livestock, any land use, as long as it's a crop. We have only crops right now and pasture. I don't choose. I, I don't I don't know what the the user is going to do. So you could come, for example. You could take the model and say, okay, I am going to model these 12 crop types, but when the way the software is written, I don't have to know what you are going to do with it. And the livestock is the same. You could choose any livestock, as long as it's livestock you can describe yeah, using. I, I, yeah. I, I understand that you can choose them, yeah. but what do you choose yeah, you, to get meaningful results? And how do you test that you've got the right ones? It's up to the researcher to choose. For example, if it's Catanning. You need a complex model that allows you to test all the possibilities. No, 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 you don't. No, no. The model is going to choose between enterprises for you. So the you model is. You choose the enterprises of the ones that you allow it to compare. First, you have to come with a, the choices you want to consider. You come with the choices you want to consider. So if you are in Catanning, you have to have a set of land uses that you want to consider. So it could be, say in Catanning, there are two main, six main crops, right? Wheat, barley, oats, and so on and so on. They are the ones that farmers are likely to consider. But if some other farmer wants to consider something else, or a different type, variety of wheat, they can still do that. But you have to have an idea of what you want to choose from. Okay? Beforehand. But the model could say, well, don't grow canola at all, don't grow uh, chickpeas, this is optimal stuff you should be growing is this, this. But you have to have, 
you have to give it things to choose among from and they have to tell it what they are. It's the same with livestock. So the merino and crossbreed and so on. Um, so you need to give it a scope and, and details what, or basically the land uses and the enterprise to choose from. But that's something that every researcher would do be, know beforehand. That's, um, for any given region, it's known what crops are grown and what livestock are used. Uh, but still doesn't prevent you from uh, including something experimental to see if it makes sense. So I could, I could use it to evaluate a certain crop variety or a certain way of managing merino sheep that has never been tried before. And what am I changing? Uh, maybe I'm changing lambing rates, I'm changing the, how long I keep them for, I'm changing what I feed them, and so on. So I could have merino sheep, but I could have five different types of merino sheep because I'm considering five alternative ways of lambing and so on. Um, so the one, by making it simple for the user, is actually allowing people to model more complex things. But modeling more complex things by uh, um, considering different alternatives that would be harder to do if they had to develop their own models. Yeah. Students, Students so coming, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so yeah. much.